a relatively controversial uh, topic that we're uh, looking at today. Do you think the Capital Markets Authority is being too stringent when it comes to investment banking and stockbroking in the country? Yes, uh, very good afternoon to you, Eleni. Um, is the capital markets being stringent? Uh, perhaps not in what it's asking for, but perhaps yes in how soon they want the requirements put in. I mean, many of us think, yes, these regulations are necessary. They're, they obviously are going to sort of bring in more stringent measures within the industry. But perhaps we think the, the way it's being phased in perhaps is a little bit too draconian. Uh, well, just looking at the overall markets, one of the reasons uh, that we are starting to see demands on uh, capital adequacy re uh, requirements being upped is purely because we want to see the risk taken off the table. Uh, do you think that it's warranted? Do you think that many of the investment banking uh, scenarios that are playing out and perhaps stockbroking scenarios need to be relooked? Yeah, look, to some extent, yes. I mean, let's look at why it is that they want to do it. I guess the, the CMA, the Capital Markets Authority, that is, is trying to, to put in this new regulation, in, in essence, to sort of back the investor because they feel, you know, the, the investor, the, you know, the, the guys that go out there and buy the shares through these brokers need more protection. But, and they're also looking at stabilizing the industry. I guess they, what they don't want is a scenario whereby you've got a couple of stockbrokers plodding along and then all of a sudden a bear market hits and they can't really survive and you know, uh, they go bust. But, so the, the, the regulations are, are certainly very uh, necessary. I mean, s some of the, the, the brokers, I mean, what we're basically arguing is, is that, yes, you can take it up from 50 million to 250 million or you can take it up from 5 million to 50 million. But you know, to simply ask us to do it within six months as opposed to the five years that we're asking for is, is certainly, mm. uh, it's, it, it's a bit too much. I mean, uh, one also needs to realize that if you look at the comparables, let's just say you look at the banking sector, you look at the insurance sector within this country, whenever there's been such an introduction to recapitalize to a higher number, it has always been phased. It's been you know, three years with regards to the banking sector, and I think the same uh, with regards to the insurance sector. Yeah. Why does it have to be any different uh, with regards to the, the broking industry? Furthermore, one also needs to understand we're not deposit-taking institutions. So why then, you know, what I would call perhaps a little bit draconian uh, yeah. regulation. Well, you know, it's, you know, there's so many uh, factors at play here, uh, but let's start off with the fact that uh, the CMA, the Capital Markets Authority, says it won't budge. We know that the, the market is asking for three more years to implement uh, the, the new cap capital requirements. Uh, do you think that perhaps they are going to be become more flexible going forward, or do you think that perhaps we're going to be see a big shakeup so those who cannot capitalize from 50 million shillings to 250 will perhaps uh, lose their investment banking licenses and then become stockbrokers? Well, look, if, if the CMA decides not to budge, you know, so be it, they are the regulator. But then, what, then one has to ask oneself the question, what is it that I can do with 250 million shillings, you know, the license as, a, as an investment bank, and what is it that I can't do? So those uh, investment banks that will choose to lose their license, and I do know there are a few that will do that, will simply not have the ability to advise on public offerings. So, you know, let's define a public offering. Anything that is offered to the public, and by definition, that is to 100 plus or, or more investors. So if, for example, there is an IPO, there is a bonus issue, there's a rights issue, one cannot advise on a public offering. And so if you don't have the investment banking license, you couldn't do that sort of work. But if you were a stockbroker, you can certainly sponsor the transaction. So um, the, the, the other benefits to, to having the investment banking license would be the ability to underwrite, though it is questionable what can you underwrite with just you know, a $3 million balance sheet. You, know? you can also deal on your own books if you have the investment banking license and you can sort of advise on M&As. So uh, the advisory license may not be taken up by a few, but they will certainly be able to participate on, mm. on the stockbroking scene and certainly sponsor transactions if you have an IPO, they can sponsor the transaction. That really is, is the fundamental difference. And so many of these brokers will say, listen, I don't really need to advise on the transaction. I can sponsor a transaction. Uh, I don't really need the license. Well, do you think it's going to be a loss to the financial industry in Kenya if we do see some investment banks uh, becoming stockbroking firms instead? Um, not necessarily, because I tend to think we could have some very strange scenarios playing out, you know, a couple of permutations. You know, if, for example, you don't have the 250 million shillings in the bank, that does not make you overnight a bad advisor. You know, mm. you're a good advisor, you're a good advisor. Um, and so what could happen is you'll, maybe you'll have people or, or banks that do have the license, if they don't have the advisory capacity, 
they'll team up with those that do have the advisory capacity and still be doing the transactions. I, I think what's really important to understand, and, and, and this is perhaps even the CMA, I believe, may have admitted this, is is this scientific? Is there a scientific rationale as to why you you know, arrive at a figure of 250 million or why you arrive at a figure of 50 million? And to the best of my knowledge, I don't think it is. I do believe the CMA are, are, are engaging a consultant to come up with an appropriate figure as to you know, what it should be. Well, it's quite interesting that you mentioned a little earlier that the CMA, uh, of course, has given such a short period of time so that everyone does meet the deadline. Uh, and it's really unusual when it comes to regulations because we do see a three-year period or even a five-year period, as you alluded to. Why do you think that they're being so hasty when it comes to this? Uh, do you think they're trying to get rid of some bad apples? Look, the, the bad apples uh, that you've mentioned are, in essence, four. I mean, if I look at the stockbroking industry, you know, there, there were... Uh, 21 uh, brokers and then four were the bad apples that went down purely because of you know financial shenanigans misuse of public uh, uh, funds uh, well the investors and and I I in essence you know you get rid of those uh, four remember that Rencap bought one of the so-called bad apples yeah. and so we're back to 18 brokers so so really you know for for the sake of of, of four for these uh, rules to have come in it's it, it is a is a bit hard you know as um, you know one broker once told me you know, six months ago, you know, as he said, I don't wake up here every morning to defraud someone. I don't think who I'm going to defraud. I'm going to do an honest day's work, which is really the, the truth for many of us uh, in the industry. So giving us really six months to comply, I think is a bit hard. If they go ahead and do it, you know, so be it. Uh, many people will plod on. And uh, I guess when, whenever the CMA chooses to revise these regulations in, in accordance with a sort of uh, scientific rationale, then I guess the, the brokers will comply. But then again, you know, when you look at it from the CMA perspective, and one only has to look at the developed world to see how the crisis ensued, uh, and of course some of the toxic assets that many thought were triple A assets, uh, surely that most of the economies, uh, most global economies, are tr trying to implement more regulation to avoid any kind of crisis in the future. Do you think that that is definitely one of the reasonings? Um, look. You can regulate to the hills. I'm not too sure regulation is going to instill ethics in a human being. You know, ethics is ethics. Um, I, I believe the SEC regulations are are two or three thousand pages. You know, certainly more than you know the Bible and the Quran combined, and that doesn't make people any more ethical. So um, yes, you, you can regulate, regulate, regulate. But I think what we need is professionalism. It just doesn't mean that if I have 250 million shillings in the bank. I cannot be unethical or I, I can't be unprofessional. I think more than anything, what we have, for example, in uh, CASIP, the Kenya Association of Stock Brokers and Investment Banks, is seeking to sort of certify professionals, pretty much like the, 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 the legal fraternity in this country, like the accounting and auditing fraternity, which have regulatory bodies. So uh, thereby say, if you at Silence wants to practice in the investment uh, industry, I need to get certification from CASIP. And should I, for whatever reason, flout any rules or be deemed to be un unprofessional, un unethical, that license can be revoked. So yeah. what we're trying to do is, uh, the, or the Kenya Association of Stockbrokers and Investment Banks is trying to do is institute professionalism. I, I, I don't know how much regulation can do that. Really, you know, ethics, I think, is almost mutually exclusive uh, yeah. from regulation.